CTV News at 5 with Hudson Mack. Good evening and Happy New Year and welcome to a special edition of CTV News at 5. Tonight we'll take a look back at some of the top stories of 2012, the ones that made you mad, that got you talking, that might have made you laugh and touched your heart. From a speeding motorcyclist on a YouTube video to pipeline protests and the downfall of one of Victoria's highest rollers, 2012 was a year to remember. For union members, this was a year defined by labor tension with teachers and transit drivers and government workers among the groups launching job action at various times in the year. And 2012 also brought a shift to the political scene. Premier Christy Clark and her liberals saw a slide in support as the NDP gained further ground in the polls. On southern Vancouver Island, the government vowed to public pressure, announcing that medians would be installed along some of the most deadly stretches of the Malahat Highway. But not long after that, three women were killed in a crash on one of the stretches of the Malahat that didn't get the upgrade. Sewage treatment was a dominant issue throughout the capital region in 2012. The debate over whether our sewage should be treated or not became the focus of the by-election campaign in Victoria in November, with one candidate, the Liberal, referring to the plan as a billion-dollar boondoggle. It even prompted a Victoria legend to come back to the surface, Mr. Floaty. CTV's Joe Perkins reports. After decades of discussion, debate, and a whole lot of raw sewage, the future of wastewater treatment in the capital region becomes a little clearer. This is a quarter of a billion dollars. It's the funding announcement that ignited the year's hottest issue. Sewage treatment. The plan seems simple. The federal government, the province, and local governments will each pay a third of the $738 million project. A project that will see three new facilities go up in the region, including a wastewater plant at Macaulay Point where sewage will be treated before being discharged into the ocean. Early estimates peg property taxes increasing as much as 45% to pay for the municipal share. But less than a week later, the concern flowed from money. The funding commitments announced this week will be a waste of public money. To science. It is a plan based on optics and politics and completely ignores the science. Critics called it the billion dollar blunder. Opponents became a fixture outside CRD meetings. Other people popped up too. People didn't want me to resurface. Remember this guy? I'm Mr. Floaty, the ocean poo. If you're from Victoria. Victoria's most well-known number two, back for round two. And his timing could not have been any better. I will work hard to make it the most cost-effective and environmentally acceptable plan possible. With a by-election in November, the NDP's Murray Rankin treated the project as a done deal. The only candidate willing to back secondary treatment. Sure, he had support, but others did too. This is a billion dollars of our taxpayer dollars being spent that could go towards treating autistic kids. In the end, voters went with the one man willing to back the region's mega project. But inside the ongoing CRD meetings, you'd be hard pressed to know there was even an election. They are not representative of the public right now. And as the year progressed, you could hear the clock tick. And if we don't do it now, we lose $500 million worth of funding. Vote after vote, the CRD's majority forged ahead. Second looks were knocked down. Environmental assessments deemed not necessary. Secondary treatment appears to be winning. 2012 may be in the rearview mirror, but it appears the stink over sewage will last well into 2013. Joe Perkins, CTV News, Victoria. The by-election that brought back the focus to sewage treatment in Greater Victoria was prompted by the surprise resignation of Victoria MP Denise Savoy. In August, the NDP Member of Parliament announced that she was stepping down after six years in office because of unspecified health concerns. I reflected on the fragility of life and, and the need to make the most out of the time we have. And I decided that um, I cannot represent my constituents to the standard that uh, I think they've come to expect. The government has up to Savoie has not publicly revealed what the health issue is, but she was prominent and active during the by-election campaign, supporting the eventual winner, the NDP's Murray Rankin. Policing and politics intersected in 2012 with the provincial government intervening in a Squamalt's decision to hire the RCMP to patrol the town streets. CTV's Stephen Andrew brought us a reaction the day that the province told the municipality that would not be allowed. 
BC's Justice Minister has rejected Esquimalt's choice of the RCMP for police services. Shirley Bond is ordering the town to stay in an amalgamated police force with the city of Victoria. I've made it very clear that there needs to be a more equitable relationship, and I expect to see those changes take place. The decision is a severe blow to Esquimalt's mayor. My community has expended time, effort, angst, uh, money. That has been absolutely ignored. Desjardin has long complained her municipality is saddled with escalating costs and not enough say on how police patrol her community. To address those issues, the province is ordering a number of changes. Among them, the two municipalities must work out a new policing agreement by the end of October. Finances and governance issues must be addressed. Community advisory groups will be set up in both municipalities to better reflect the needs of each community. And the force will get a new name, the Victoria and Esquimalt Police Department. This general public at 7 or 2 the recommendations are contained in an exhaustive review of the infighting between the Squamalk and Victoria. The report concludes concerns began to fester among politicians, senior staff and officers of Vic PD as communication began to break down. Victoria's mayor is not prepared to say the police board did not know what it was doing, but he acknowledges there are issues. Let's recognize that it is the only police board uh, that got forced together. It's the only amalgamated police board. The decision to continue with an amalgamated police force ends months of speculation and uncertainty for the men and women who police both communities, many of whom believed that if Esquimalt was allowed to move ahead with the RCMP, they would lose their jobs. So we're pleased now that we have some certainty and, and we can, can move forward with the issues and, and we're more than willing to work with everyone involved. Victoria's chief is also expressing relief, promising he is willing to make changes, including focusing more officers and patrols in Esquimalt. We have tremendous friends uh, throughout Esquimalt, and I know the, the people I talk to, including two of our staff members that work at the West Division, are absolutely thrilled that we're at the stage we're at right now. But whether that will be enough to convince Esquimalt politicians the new model will work remains to be seen. Well, highway safety may never have been more in the spotlight than it was in 2012, specifically the notorious Malahat Highway north of Victoria. After years of drivers saying that it just wasn't safe, the province stepped up in the spring to announce approval of millions of dollars in safety improvements. But then, just a few months later, a series of accidents, one killing three people. And CTV Stephanie Sherlock reports more change for the Malahat may be on the horizon this year. More than 22,000 people drive this windy stretch of highway every day. Safety is the highest priority we have in the Ministry of Transportation. In April, the province put its money where its mouth is, announcing $8 million worth of safety improvements for sections known for being treacherous. In total, we will be installing an additional 5.4 kilometres of uh, concrete medium barrier on that highway, which will then bring to 40% uh, the total amount of the Malahat that will be uh, divided through medium barrier placement. One area not slated for the barriers is here. This is what we commonly refer to as NASCAR Corner. It starts just north of us here at the, uh, as you come into this long protracted corner from the this Malahat Summit, the Totem Pole Lookout, back around to Whitaker Road. It's also the site of a devastating accident in October that killed three people. A crash first responders say wouldn't have been deadly if medians had been there. Would they have all perished? I believe in my heart, no. The province still insisted NASCAR Corner was safe. It's not slated for, for barriers. Uh, when we took a look at the whole corridor, we had, did a report earlier this year. This particular location was not a priority area. The Integrated Road Safety Unit agreed. We don't think that the Malahat's dangerous. We think that it's a high-risk, high-consequence corridor. But before you could even say highway safety, another crash in the very same place. A blue car attempted to pass on the inside lane. That car then touched the front and right tire of the sledge truck and spun sideways in the incoming traffic where it was struck by um, a uh, Volkswagen Jetta. The two people in the Jetta walked away, but the driver of the other car had to be rescued with the jaws of life. This time, the province took notice, and a new transportation minister says changes are coming. We will be beginning the engineering and design work on this section and responding to what we hear from that review in terms of what could be the, the likely solution to making this section safer. Assessment will take four to six months. Drivers and first responders hope changes come soon after. Stephanie Sherlock, CTV News, Victoria. 
Motorcycle safety was also on many people's minds after a viral video caught up with a speeding rider on the Trans-Canada Highway outside Victoria. The video was posted on YouTube showing the motorcyclist weaving in and out of traffic at breakneck speeds of nearly 300 kilometers an hour. The rider's identity was a mystery, one that CTV's Joe Perkins set out to solve. It's ridiculous, you know, the dangers he's taking and causing right there is out of control. The video is shocking. A motorcyclist blowing past cars, weaving between vehicles at speeds just shy of 300 kilometers an hour. It looks so dangerous. <laughs> it kind of looks like he's going against traffic. It isn't the first reckless driving video to be posted to YouTube. Others such as this one from a biker known as Ghost Rider show similar behavior. But the latest video from an island rider has sparked discussion, particularly online where bloggers are calling out for the person's arrest, even offering up tips. We've been provided more than one name from the community and uh, really our investigator is in receipt uh, of these names and he's actively pursuing them. One post claims the writer is Randy Scott and provides a link to his Facebook page. There, CTV News found photos, including this undated one of a motorcycle next to a police car with a caption that reads, no license, no insurance, no license plate, got called in for 250 on my way to the ferry. CTV News sent Randy Scott a message asking if he was the man behind the wheel in this video. He replied, Cops seized the bike on Friday. I don't have a bike license and the bike in question has never been insured. Wasn't me. Are Saanich police investigating a man by the name of Randy Scott? Again, we have more than one name. Police will not confirm if Randy Scott is under investigation or if any charges are pending. On the BC court registry, CTV News found a similar name, a Randy George Scott who has run into problems with the law in the past, charged with several driving infractions including speeding on Vancouver Island. An online search shows 13 court appearances, all in Victoria since 2008. Local riders say the video is the last thing motorcyclists need. It certainly affects the way people think about us, you know, and uh, reading some of the comments on the YouTube, people saying, I'll open my doors. He says it's an unnecessary black cloud over the riding community put there by a rider hiding behind a video. We are going to push us as far as it'll go. Everything is on the table. Whoever posted the daredevil thrill ride is getting the attention he or she was looking for. Randy Scott, CTV News contacted on Facebook, says he is not the rider. Well, he maintains his innocence, but not long after our report aired, police impounded the motorcycle in that video, saying it was registered to Randy Scott's mother. Scott was then charged with dangerous driving, and he later turned himself in to RCMP in Kelowna. Safety at an intersection in downtown Victoria came into question in August once again when a tour bus hit a woman crossing the street, killing her. The woman was later identified as 27-year-old Yuka Imazumi, a Japanese citizen living and working in Victoria. She was crossing Douglas at Humboldt when she was hit, and even months later, it is unclear why the driver did not see her. A similar crash at the same intersection killed a tourist on his honeymoon in 1999. Just a few months later in October, another deadly crash killed a teenage boy in Langford, A.J. Wakeling, and his twin brother had just stepped off a bus on Souk Road. A.J. stepped out onto the roadway to cross and was hit by an oncoming pickup truck. He was rushed to the hospital, taken off life support two days later, the first of many pedestrian accidents in the capital region. And another young life lost to young, Amanda Todd, committed suicide in October after years of being tormented by bullies. The Port Coquitlam teenager had been bullied online and in person, and just weeks before her death, uh, she had posted a poignant video to YouTube, one that was viewed by millions of people after she killed herself. Her death drew sharp criticism of the way we deal with bullying and a renewed commitment to stop bullying in our schools, our communities, and online. No! 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 Still ahead on this special edition of CTV News, the Northern Gateway Pipeline Project divides the province in 2012 and in the fall draws thousands to the lawn of the BC Legislature. Also ahead, a year of declining support for the BC Liberals from clashes with unions to an exodus of high-profile cabinet ministers, a look back at the challenges the Liberal government faced in 2012.
Continuing now with our look back at some of the biggest stories of the year and perhaps the biggest environmental story throughout 2012 in British Columbia was the Northern Gateway Pipeline Project. People up and down the West Coast opposed the project, saying that the financial benefits simply are not worth the environmental risk. In late October, the opposition made its way to the lawn of the legislature. CTV's Joe Perkins was there. Oh, yeah. It starts with a symbol, a sign of what they're trying to protect. Lifted high for everyone to see, on the lawn a crowd believed to be more than 3,000 strong, all ready to fight. No! Fire! No! Fire! No! Fire! Organizers know going in, success today depends on the turnout. The By the first speaker, it's clear. One thing I can see right off the bat is we're winning. The support came through. One by one, opponents to the Northern Gateway Pipeline project have their turn. Aboriginal leaders. What are you willing to do to stop them? Are you willing to lay down in front of the bulldozers? From every corner of the province, each delivering a message that when it comes to tar sands, tankers and pipelines, their mind is made up. This decision that's been made is no. No doesn't mean maybe, no means no. They've said no before, but not like this. Never this organized, never with this much support. Take a look around out here today. This is what a healthy democracy looks like. Political leaders. We stand here as a positive statement. When you have a friend with an addiction, you need an intervention, and we are the intervention. From every level, many calling out the Harper government for its recent changes to environmental laws. Closer to home with the provincial government not in session and the legislature on lockdown, Christy Clark is also targeted. Who's going to change the government in, in Victoria if this current government doesn't change the way they're doing business? After the Aboriginal, Union and political leaders, a familiar face. Well-known environmentalist Zipporah Berman, arrested in 1993 for her role in a similar rally. The most important thing that we can do is sit down and work it out. I want to say one thing very clearly to Premier Christy Clark. This is not one of those times. With that, the climax of the sit-in, a sign of how far protesters will go. A massive black sheet representing the length of an oil tanker is rolled out and eventually illegally pounded into the ground. Whatever it takes, they say. Was today a success? I think so. The numbers and these people really do speak for how serious the issue is. In the end, it works, an issue they will continue to fight until they are heard. Joe Perkins, CTV News, Victoria. The legislature, also the scene of a massive protest held in March. Thousands rallied, opposing back-to-work legislation the government imposed on striking B.C. teachers. The teachers had been working without a contract since June of 2011 and had staged a full-blown three-day strike. They weren't alone in job action. It was a year of labor unrest in B.C. as workers in government, at colleges, universities and in health care fought and walked out to find better contracts. In Greater Victoria, B.C. transit drivers and mechanics also launched job action. It lasted through the fall and is expected to escalate in 2013. The Liberal government spent the year at odds with unions and with many voters, and in the end, some members decided it was time to go. In just one day, three Liberal cabinet ministers called it quits. And by the time summer was over, offices throughout the legislature had been emptied in what turned to be out to be nothing short of an exodus. CTV's Stephen Andrew reports. First, want to put to rest the rumors that my wife and I are expecting another baby. <laughs> uh, can With his signature style, George ago. Abbott makes light of a big decision. Referencing fellow Liberal Kevin Falcon's reason for leaving for politics, Abbott is now about. making for the door himself. I would not be here uh, taking this step uh, were I to have the extraordinary uh, opportunity to be Premier, but uh, history didn't, uh, didn't work out that way. Abbott's resignation caps off a tumultuous year as Education Minister. Unable to reach an agreement with teachers, Abbott imposed a contract, becoming the target of personal attacks. Despite the turmoil, he says being education minister is his favorite job, a ministry he is sorry to leave. But Abbott says after 33 years in public life, he is tired of politics, the lack of collaboration, and his inability to change the system. Abbott's decision comes on the same day as two other ministers step aside. Parliamentary Secretary John Less and Children and Families Minister Mary McNeil are also retiring from provincial politics. 
The resignations come a day after Finance Minister Kevin Falcon stepped aside. All say the Liberals can win the next election. All believe public opinion will change. None of this should come as a surprise to the Premier. She gave her caucus an end of summer deadline to let her know if they were planning to run for re-election or not. But it does create a problem. Christy Clark now has four seats at the cabinet table to fill, and there's an expectation more Liberals could resign in the coming days. The lone Vancouver Island cabinet minister staying is downplaying the resignations, opting to look at the future. That's what What's always exciting is uh, to see those new people who want to enter politics, want to be part of a team, a team that delivers good government services, which we've done. The NDP is also pushing a strong team, but questions the experience of the yet-to-be-named new cabinet. Clearly, uh, the team that's strong is the NDP team, and I think our message of positive politics is resonating out there. And positive politics is what Abbott was looking for, too. But unlike other Liberals who have quit, Abbott is adamant about his return to political life. Someone may ask me this question about whether I might come back in the future. Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, for me, uh, uh, never is never. Uh, I've, uh, I've had a great run politically, but I've, I've, uh, I've exhausted that part of my life. Stephen Andrews. Abbott would not be the last to jump, though. Other high-profile Liberals bowing out would include Kevin Kruger, Colin Hansen, and Blair Lextrom. And on Vancouver Island, after first announcing that he would run again, Parksville Qualicum Liberal MLA Ron Cantillon had a change of heart late in the year, announcing that he will not seek re-election in May after all. 2012 brought some measure of relief to two families in the Cowichan Valley after both of their daughters were brutally murdered. In April, William Elliott was arrested and charged with first-degree murder in the death of Taisha Jones and charged with the same count in the death of Carrie Ann Stone. He's accused of killing the 42-year-old Stone in July 2010, the 18-year-old Jones in January 2011. And in late December, Greg Brotherston was sentenced to three years in prison for the manslaughter death of 57-year-old Rick Green. Brotherston hit Green outside the Country Rose Pub in Colwood in October. Green fell to the ground and suffered a massive head injury. One of Vancouver Island's most notorious fraud artists became a free man in 2012. Former investment advisor Ian Thau was granted full parole and was released from prison in late October. Thau had been in custody since March of 2010 for defrauding 20 clients out of $8 million. Bear Mountain developer Lynn Berry nearly lost everything in 2012. The year began with a lawsuit. The Bellagio Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas filed a claim seeking uh, against Berry, seeking more than $2 million U.S. in unpaid bills. An RCMP investigation into his financial dealings with Bear Mountain was forwarded to the Attorney General's office for prosecution. And the bank kicked him out of his multi-million dollar mansion on Bear Mountain, also foreclosing on his waterfront home in Yubo as well. Still ahead on this special year-end edition of CTV News at 5, our Astrid Brownschmidt brings us the top weather stories of 2012. And a whirlwind year for Janice Edroff, from the opening of Janice Place to the Mayo Clinic and back again. That's next. Continuing now with our look back at the year in 2012 uh, is a year that Janice Edroff will never forget. From the highest high, the opening of Janice Place to the lowest low, the urgent struggle for a second opinion that might save her from paralysis. And in between, Janice graduated from high school. CTV's Andrew Johnson has more on the roller coaster ride for the girl whose dream began with a penny and grew into so much more. In eight short months, it grew from a muddy field to a home away from home for families whose children were being treated at Victoria General Hospital. Janice Edroff started 2012 strong, opening the doors to Janice Place in January. Hi. The 18-year-old was the brains and the fundraising muscle behind the project. It came together thanks to the generosity of more than 2,200 individuals and businesses on Vancouver Island. And people had tears in their eyes describing to us how what a warm environment it will be for the families that are going to be needing the house. Victoria's very own fundraising phenomenon. Five months later, another major milestone. Janice received a standing ovation at her graduation from Claremont Secondary School. Janice took a moment to offer her fellow grads some words of advice. 
just to keep positive and never give up on your dreams and never to give up hope. With plans to go on to university and eventually pursue a career in child development, Janice's future looked bright. But just three months after graduation, Janice was once again faced with serious questions about her health. It used to be like this small, but then it's grown. A growing tumor on her leg was taking away muscle and nerve function. The tumor is kind of going overboard now. It's getting to that point where it's we might be too late for it, and um, that's what I'm worried about. Janice has maybe three or four major humdinger problems, and um, we've always been hoping that they would keep themselves settled and quiet, but now we're seeing some of them come up and they need to be dealt with. Janice needed surgery that could leave her paralyzed. The world-renowned Mayo Clinic looked like her best hope, but there was a problem. The BC medical system wouldn't pay for it. Why would you not pay for some, like, someone who's just giving back to the community like so much and not pay for them to go down to get a better opinion? After an outpouring of community support and fundraising, Janice and her family head to Mayo. And amid increasing public pressure, the Premier agrees to pay for it. We should we should find a way, and I know that we're talking to the family and to her specialists about it now. Yes, we should. After the roller coaster that was 2012, Janice is hoping 2013 will be a smoother ride, one that starts with a life-changing surgery at the Mayo Clinic. Andrew Johnson, CTV News. Well, 2012 was a year of sunshine and storms and everything in between. CTV's Astrid Brownschmidt joins us now with a look at the top island weather stories of the past year. Astrid. Oh, well, Hudson, from droughts to deep snow to an impressive summer light show, Vancouver Island had its share of dramatic weather this year. Spring officially began March 20th, but you wouldn't have known it looking at Victoria's weather. Terrible. I mean, this is the worst it's ever been this time of year. Throughout the capital, blossoms were late. In the Comox Valley, the threat of snow pushed through March, only to be erased from memory a few weeks later when the heat hit the island, breaking temperature records around Mother's Day. Number nine, wind chaos. A powerful windstorm whipped across Vancouver Island March 12th. It blew down trees, knocked out power to nearly 100,000 people, and it put transportation on hold as gusts ranged from 120 to nearly 150 kilometers per hour. The brave were drawn to Tofino and Euclulet. The strongest gusts of 187 kilometers per hour were measured at Mary Island near Half Moon Bay on the Sunshine Coast. Mount Washington had a great year. By the end of the season, the Island Alpine Resort had the deepest snowpack in Canada. So much snow meant the slopes were open for Father's Day in June. By the end of November, Mount Washington opened the season early again for a fourth year in a row. From berries to wine, the dry summer heat delivered on Vancouver Island. Farmers brought home a bumper crop of berries. Island wineries raised their glasses to Mother Nature. Sunny, warm days and crisp nights made for the best grape harvest in decades. But the weather left other harvests out in the cold. The ones that were picking, they were barely even getting their gas money back. Chantrell mushrooms didn't get the cool temperatures and wet weather they needed to flourish. Let's admit it, we are opinionated when it comes to our weather, and this year we rewrote the weather dictionary to better describe our seasons. January, we used that word again when June fell flat. Then we came up with Jalember to describe our lousy July, and finally Oct August. When summer did kick in, it stayed right the way through Thanksgiving, and some days in October felt like August. We had a slow start to summer, but once it settled in, it stayed sunny. In August, Victoria enjoyed 319 hours of sunshine, and September had 289 hours of sunshine, more than 70 hours above normal. Winter walloped us early in the new year. January 17th to 20th, snow, ice and wind crippled the capital region and most of the South Island. Ditches were littered with vehicles, schools and businesses were closed and power outages were widespread. June 2012 earned its distinction as January. It was wet, dull and cool and temperatures averaged only 18 degrees below normal. And there was so little sun, it was the fourth dullest June on record. Vancouver Island saw so little rain between mid-July and mid-October, many communities were on the brink of a drought. Nowhere was that more apparent than in the Cowichan Valley, where salmon couldn't make it upstream without help. And the number one weather story of 2012? 
Thunder and lightning lit up the skies over southern Vancouver Island. An upper disturbance over western Washington spread unstable air into southern BC. Thunderstorms are so rare here. Environment Canada says Victoria averages only one day of thunderstorms every two years. Pretty impressive. Now, looking forward to 2013, the seasonal outlook for the rest of winter looks fairly normal. So normal temperatures, normal amounts of precipitation. But we'll see, Hudson. Yeah, we'll see what the new normal is. Mm -hmm. All right, Astrid, thank you. You're welcome. Still ahead, it was the year wildlife took over the Saanich Peninsula. Farmers facing off against deer and cougars. And the tsunami debris that never showed up. With a few notable exceptions, including a Harley Davidson that washed ashore, the wave we were bracing for didn't reach our shores, at least not yet. Well, farmers on the Saanich Peninsula spent 2012 at odds with local government, and as the year ended, the dispute over deer edged towards a showdown. Farmers wanted the government to take the lead on the out-of-control deer population that is decimating their crops and eating into their bottom lines. But at least one local mayor fired back, saying that farmers are free to pick up a gun and solve the problem on their own. CTV's Louise Hartland reports. See, come look at this, where they're just nibbling at the buds here right now. Ray and Rob Gailey say they have lost more than $100,000 in crops this year alone to deer and geese. They destroy you carrots and your potatoes or it could be cauliflower or lettuce whatever that's taken a lot of your money out that is on your line of credit for your planting for next year. The family says it can't keep up with the damage. The Gailies have been forced to close 170 of the farm's 300 acres over the last five years. Now they are calling on local government to act. Can I not plant my crop and just worry about keeping my crop healthy? Why is all my time going into keeping the deer out of here and the geese out of here? It's a battle that I shouldn't have to be fighting. You know, our politicians should be standing up for us. Saanich Mayor Frank Leonard says the family has the right to stand up on its own. You cannot discharge a firearm in Saanich, but the mayor says farmers are an exception. But he does have the right to farm to override the municipality. Uh, it's been many years since they applied to the police department for a fire uh, discharge permit. Uh, and we knew that uh, when the police said no, that they could go to right to farm and, and override that. Uh, but, but Ray Gailey has said to me that they don't want to uh, get in the business of shooting wildlife because they're also in the tourism business. Uh, so they would much prefer the government does it for them. This is the first time that um, I've heard Mayor Leonard say that we actually do have the right to do it anyway. And um, I guess we're going to have to make a family decision. But I would rather do this with the support of the municipality. You can shoot deer and other pests in central Saanich with a permit. But farm owners say the population is too big to be managed with crop protection. And farmers are tired of waiting for help after years of promises. And there seems to be another meeting to talk about a meeting to have another meeting. And, um, you know, they've heard from loud and clear from the farmers and even the people that were at the CRD uh, meetings that we've attended. Um, they hear that the farmers need help. There's no denying that the farmers need help. But killing deer is a contentious issue, and it seems no one wants to pull the trigger. If everybody wants local food and they want to be food secure on Vancouver Island, they got to start supporting the farmers. That doesn't mean kill every deer in sight. That just means get off your duff, get out of the meetings, and get to doing something about the problem, because it is a problem. Louise Hardland, CTV News, Central Saanich. Also this year, conservation officers say pulling the trigger was their last option, but they used it after finally tracking down a cougar that was stalking farm animals on the Saanich Peninsula. The killing spree began in August, and by December, dozens of farm animals had been slaughtered in the dead of night. The morning after the final killings, a conservation officer tracked down the two-year-old male that had been on his most wanted list for months. Probably 25 sheep, uh, about 10 goats, two alpacas, and that's just the, the ones that we know about. I hate having to do that. In this case, with a cougar that's killed that much livestock, I don't have any other option. I'm not allowed to relocate a cougar that's done that. It's not something that I can even consider doing. The Conservation Service says the cougar had to be killed because it eventually could have moved on to larger prey, including people. Floating debris from the 2011 tsunami in Japan began washing ashore on Vancouver Island this past year, but the big wave we were told to expect never arrived. The debris that washed up was mostly small and identifiable, with a few notable exceptions. One was a Harley-Davidson motorcycle that washed ashore on Haida Gwaii in April and was eventually reunited with its owner. A month earlier, a fishing vessel was spotted adrift off Alaska. 
In October, the second largest earthquake that BC has ever seen struck just off Haida Gwaii. A 7.7 .7 magnitude shaker triggered evacuations in several communities, but the damage, it turns out, was minor. The tsunami warning that was imposed for the area was later cancelled. The provincial emergency program was criticized for leaving coastal communities such as Tofino in the dark after the quake for about 45 minutes. Tofino officials made the decision on their own to sound their new tsunami warning system, but later learned the wave was never a threat to their community. As we look back at uh, the stories of 2012, a lot of island athletes were uh, in the news in a big way, Myra. Yeah, and a big one for sure, Hudson, because it's been called the greatest single individual accomplishment by a Canadian professional athlete. 2012, the entire sports world learned about Ryder Hedgedahl's cycling heroics. Ryder took his place among his sports elite in May when he won the Giro d'Italia, becoming the first Canadian ever to win a Grand Tour event. The historic day was celebrated in Hedgedahl's hometown right here. Here's Joe Perkins. History in the making. Ryder Hegedal is getting it done. And halfway around the world, Hegedal cycling friends take it all in. Oh, my palms are sweating. I'm, but I'm on the verge of tears, I think. Minutes later, the 31-year-old from Victoria makes history. That is gonna do it. Ryder Hegedal wins the Giro d'Italia. He's the first Canadian to win a major tournament in the cycling world. Oh, the Giro d'Italia in Milan, Italy, a long way from the Victoria bike shop he grew up in. This is just a huge step for, for Canadian cycling. It's a huge step like for him. Total cycling ambassador for Canada. Uh, fantastic guy. I think he's the Wayne Gretzky cycling. Potentially becoming the first ever Canadian to win a Grand Tour. Hedgedal entered the final leg of the race 31 seconds back from the leader. In the end, he finished first, 16 seconds ahead of the competition. At the finish line, a hug from his wife, Ashley, waving Canadian flags and the sound of the Canadian national anthem. We were just crying and even he teared up and it's just, it's, it's a little bit unreal, but fabulous, just fantastic. We're so proud for him. Shortly after the tears, Hedgedal sends a message straight from the top of the cycling world to Victoria. What can I say? I mean, the support's just incredible whenever I'm back home. It's uh, pretty overwhelming and, you know, they're always with me when I'm far away and, and doing hard work, so thank you. Hedgedal has Canada to himself today. Celebrations were held across Vancouver Island. He's just proven today that he's the greatest Canadian cyclist of all time, no question about it. A win for Hedgedal and Canadians across the world. Well, nearing the end of his contract and entering the twilight of his career, everyone expected that Steve Nash would be wooed to a championship contender, but no one expected him to pick the L.A. Lakers. No, the Lakers, they are considered the enemy in Phoenix, but an opportunity to play with Kobe Bryant and stay close to his children made Nash go Hollywood. The addition of Nash and Dwight Howard to the star-studded Lakers lineup made them the preseason favorite to challenge for an NBA championship. With Nash being injured most of the year, we've yet to see the run-and-gun Showtime Lakers we were all so excited for. Well, it may win the title for the most frustrating story of 2012. The NHL lockout has left hockey fans searching for ways to spend their Saturday nights. The NHL locked out their players on September 15th when neither side could come to terms on a new collective bargaining agreement. The fans in Port McNeil got to spend some valuable time with hockey's holy grail. LA Kings defenseman Willie Mitchell brought the cup to Vancouver Island. He first took it on a solo fishing trip and then celebrated with the people of his hometown. Willie was a second member of the Kings to hoist the cup. Dustin Brown handed it to the journeyman blue liner. I uh, can't wait to bring it back to BC and Vancouver Island and uh, Port McNeil is coming. Port McNeil, it's coming. That was a great moment. And also, we have to say, two high school teams. The Oak Bay Boys Volleyball Team, AAA, and the Mount Doug Rams. Both mm. teams went back-to-back -back BC Banners this year. So, good for them. Not an easy thing to do. Not at all. Both teams talking about a three-peat. Well, here we go. Why not? Here we go. Another Leave them year. on the island. All right, my thank you. You're welcome. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. We will take a break. Don't go away. Adam has a look back at 2012 in arts and lifestyle for us when we come back. A year of celebrity settings on the island, those stories and more as this special edition of CTV News continues. All right, you know who's here and let me be the first to say Happy New Year. 
Thank you for not saying Sparky. Well, that was that's so 2012. Although, hey, there's hope. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe it'll uh, find its way into the new year. We'll find out. 2012, though, uh, filled with famous people descending on Vancouver Island. Many were here for the star-studded David Foster Foundation's 25th anniversary Miracle Weekend. Hallelujah. It's a real honor, and I, you know, I mean. I've had a lot of things happen in my life. This is right up there with the best of them. I mean, it's, uh, it's my home. The weekend began with the path along Victoria's famous inner harbor being renamed David Foster Way. The Grammy-winning producer was joined by famous friends, including Pamela Anderson, Michael Bublé, Rick Hansen. Just hours later, Foster and his friends walked a purple carpet to the Fairmont Empress for a gala fundraiser hosted by the still under construction Oak Bay Beach Hotel. I, when I come home, I land on the island, I get out of the plane, you can breathe in, you can smell the salty air and just the clean air and it's just, you feel completely at peace. In the end, they inspired this community to raise more than four million dollars for families of children waiting for organ transplants. Uh, the most talked about uh, celebrity in December of 2012, uh, not even born yet, the future king or queen of England is on the way. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge announced Kate Middleton's pregnancy a bit earlier than they had planned after she was hospitalized with a severe form of morning sickness. The joyous news was tempered with tragedy, though. A nurse at the hospital committed suicide after falling victim to a telephone prank by a pair of Australian DJs. The Duchess, though, was released after several days in hospital, and the baby is due in the spring. Few people from this newsroom uh, earned some fame as well. Went viral in 2012, actually earning international infamy. Beginning with CTV's Joe Perkins and his report on the barbecue chip bandits. Too tasty to pass up. The women were walking home from a night of drinking when something caught their eye, an open garage just like this one. And what did they see inside? Zeller's brand barbecue potato chips. Well, most of us in the newsroom agreed the, the best part of Joe's story going viral was when he got a roasting from Anderson Cooper on CNN. Mm, wait, what, what's the big deal about Zeller's brand chips? Actually, you know what? Forget it. Because surely the reporter has better things to do than to explain that. So they took the chips and started walking, but they didn't get far. The barbecue bandits were busted by the homeowner. I love the eating demonstration. <laughs> and then, of course, there was that canoodle controversy between Andrew Johnson and Astrid Braunschmidt. It began after a story had just aired where a woman used the word canoodling. Andrew thought that he'd try to get a little creative and, and segue during the weather forecast. It's time now for a full look at your forecast with Astrid. Maybe we can canoodle before you get into it about... Um... We're not going to be canoodling. What? <laughs> oh, I thought canoodle meant chat. <laughs> Astrid, you're lucky there's a producer in my ear. I would have, I would have carried that on and on. You know what? You just made the blooper reel. Good oh, job, Andrew. Classic. Classic. Take it away. Get me off camera. I didn't actually know the definition of canoodling. Oh, you've gone international, my friend. Maybe we could. You have it from the Today Show to Australian TV. Andrew's ignorance about the definition of canoodle was rebroadcast on morning and late night talk shows around the world, eventually watched on YouTube by millions. Uh, and they were not uh, the only uh, people facing good-natured ridiculing in 2012. I've spent the year sitting next to this guy every night, uh, enduring, a se enduring a seemingly endless barrage of sparkies and teasing about my old TV. Oh. German pop star Heino. <laughs> We celebrated in the newsroom this afternoon with a, with a nice cream cake. You always say that you, you're not a Heino fan, but uh, I happen to know different. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you watched. Well, hang on. Here's the feed now. Here's the live feed now. Cher, Cheryl and Liam are watching Heino videos while the newscast is on. They should watch the news. Just so you know, our producer made me put that in. I hope you're happy. I hope 2013 is the year we get you a new TV. <laughs> but we're going to keep showing that one, I'm afraid. And I won't say it today, but I can't promise I won't say it this year. <laughs> Adam, thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you, Hudson. And to you. That is uh, a year in review for us. A look back at 2012. Thank you for being